for me, the biggest change that people can make, whether it's on a personal level, in a company, in an organization, in a city, is to shift classes, to change from, as I mentioned earlier, this compliance, we have to do this, we have to be less bad at it, and put on the glasses of opportunity. What can this bring us? How can it enrich my life to start biking more instead of always taking my car to start eating plant-based, etc. cetera. To, uh, and you can do that on all levels. Serge de Gelder is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Serge is CEO and co-founder at Future Proof, a company driven by the belief that a sustainable, fossil-free future is a better, more attractive future. Serge believes that it is within our power to reverse the climate crisis and build a fossil-free circular economy. Taking action re represents the biggest business opportunity of the century, and action will sort the winners from the losers, both in business and amongst cities and nations. Serge co-founded Future Proofed, a leading sustainability and climate action company serving both cities and businesses with a digital tool to collaborate, develop, monitor, and implement their climate plans. Future, future Proof Cities is the current trusted and used by 140 European municipalities. That is unbelievable. Serge is an avid speaker taking the stage at global events such as TEDx Flanders and Innovation Summit and appearing in publications like the World Magazine and, and Detailed. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. Bel probably some Belgian magazine. He's given hundreds of lectures in cities all over the world, including Stanford, Yale, Singa, Beijing, India, Dubai, Togo, Budapest, on the choices we face regarding climate change and the opportunity of a sustainable economy. Sir trained as an engineer in Lemon and in Delft and worked for Baxter Healthcare for seven years, including 15 months abroad in Chicago, Illinois, USA. There's one other thing that my listeners need to know. Uh, Serge is a climate reality leader, one of the first to be trained in Europe by Al Gore, specifically chosen, selected to be trained. Um, and I really am glad to see him and to have him here. Welcome to the show, Serge. Thank you, Mark. What a great introduction. Thank you. <laughs> You're most welcome. I'm so glad you can make it and, and, and it's good to see you. Our paths have kind of crossed over the years with climate reality and, and you know, I've, I've stalked some of the things that you've been doing online and it was just really nice to, by chance, um, have the opportunity for this to work out uh, because we both do things in innovation. I received a, a message mm -hmm. that uh, um, we should get together and align and speak and um, uh, through Innovators Magazine and, and 1.5 Media. And, and I'm glad it worked out because um, you're, you're a great man and been doing this for a long time. So uh, you your original training was in 2006 in Nashville, Tennessee. And, and yeah. uh, you were <clears throat> involved a little bit before that as well but uh, after that you've mm -hmm. kind of done done your own thing and, and refined it and made it such <clears throat> a popular uh i don't know a, a good cause to be to be following and i think it's taken this course over the years so i'm i'm excited to set out with you today on, on a little deep dive dialogue discussion mm -hmm. and i want to mm -hmm. start off off the bat with probably to get it out of the room the elephant in the room how in the hell have you weathered this year, this pandemic? So I know some personal things have come your way, but but Black Lives Matter, the pandemic, and, and many other things happen. You've had these years of experience and, and focusing on climate and solutions and trying to put a positive spin on what actions we can take. Has any of that helped you weather this craziness we've had, we've occurred this year? Yeah, it's been a crazy year. Um, but first, let me tell you, I was really excited to uh, to learn that uh, you were actually in the first uh, 
a group of trainees with uh, Al Gore, which was still held at his ranch in, in Tennessee. Part That's so Tennessee, exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was in the second training and I found it an incredibly eye-opening experience, but uh, I, I never actually met one of the true pioneers, so <laughs> yeah. that's great. <clears throat> um, now about this year, it's been, a, it's been a, personally for me a, a strange year on many levels, because uh, uh, in last year, in end of October, I was also diagnosed with uh, leukemia. So uh, it's been not only, uh, you know, the difficult year that uh, everybody uh, had had uh, with everything seemingly crashing down together in the world uh, in terms of what happened with as you say black lives matter and covid and then the election and all of that uh, but on a personal level um, i was out for six months uh, trying to uh, you know uh, battle my way out of uh, acute uh, leukemia luckily that went well so um, i'm back to work now the worst is behind me <clears throat> but I had a kind of a, a preview, if you want, of what the lockdown would be because I was locked up in in the hospital and all of a sudden, you know, your world changes as, as it does now. When you look at the images of people walking with, uh, with masks on the streets, it, it looks like scenes from a science fiction movie. I, I just, a couple of days ago, I, I, I re-watched uh, Avatar, you know, the James Cameron movie, yes. uh, the extended uh, director's cut, and there's some additional scenes. And the very first scene is a scene in a city very densely populated where everybody's wearing a mask uh, and it's set in 2145 or so. And I thought, wow, this is so close to, to this reality that we're facing now. The flip side, though, is that I think many people have rediscovered uh, a lot of, you know, values and precious moments uh, during the, the lockdown. I did so when I was ill, you know, everything is suddenly grinding to a stop and then just spending some time with my kids and my loved ones and friends, uh, whatever it is, how small it is, it's all of a sudden, you know, all that counts. And I saw that uh, around me during the COVID lockdown, people suddenly rediscovered the beauty of just walking or biking or, or even having just a, a Zoom conversation without distraction, you know, feeling the connection. And, and so there's a lot of what my son calls collateral beauty that came about of, of this uh, crazy year, uh, I think. And if you take it one level higher, uh, the businesses and the cities uh, we talk with uh, have also been faced with this stark reality, but are really set to grasp this crisis to come out better. Uh, you know, like Leuven is a, is a city uh, where our offices are. Um, I'm involved in the nonprofit in Leuven that drives the climate uh, roadmap. It's called Leuven 2030. And part for that, Leuven won the European Capital of Innovation Award this year uh, for, for their climate efforts. And when you talk to the mayor, uh, he says, you know, it's really hard to deal with COVID and the lockdown. And, you know, Leuven is a very warm city where, where people uh, you know, uh, stick together, etc. And now they have to be apart and stay in home. It's really hard, but he's really set to rebuild love and grasp that opportunity to, you know, rebuild it in a, in a fossil free way, if you want, but also deal with the consequences uh, of, of COVID at the same time. So it's hard. Uh, it's unexpected, but it's a good wake up call that anyone's life can change like that, you know, at the moment's notice. Uh, but it's also an incredible opportunity to, to look at what we have uh, that's precious and valuable and to rethink how we want to um, um, uh, rebuild uh, the future. One thing I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with is that we're all stuck in this this race and there's always a moving goalpost you know we we study we want to be uh, have a good diploma and then a good job and then a promotion and then a house and then a bigger house and and the goalpost is always moving and all of a sudden 
everybody's been faced with this reality and and i think there's a lot of good things that will come out of this if we make it true i, I really agree with that i um sustainability is not an end point that's not something we ever reach it's something that we always need to strive for and uh keep working towards it's a continual journey mm -hmm. um uh, throughout the decades i i want to you know, without prying too hard, but I want to kind of do a little bit deeper dive in what, what you said and, and maybe kind of try to draw out some more things. So um, <clears throat> I'm so glad that you 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 fought this and, and it's because having uh, leukemia being in, in, in the hospital, that uh, puts you in the high risk of somebody who could be vulnerable to get COVID mm -hmm. uh, as mm -hmm. well, but also just weaken immune system and all sorts of battles that you're going through there physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I wanna know that um, all these things that you've been doing over the years with that sustainability, with the climate, with resilience, with these, these overarching subjects that you've you've had focus on have any of them given you strength or resilience to, that made it a little bit easier to fight the fight to get through to know how to eat properly or how to deal with the things that you were facing with leukemia, as well as not not just that but maybe in your family life. And when you did get back into business, this is kind of say, you know, because I had a little bit better foundation or base of, of this different way of living or this knowledge that it, it provided me with, with a better model or a little bit more resilience to make it through these hard times because I knew they were coming. Is there mm -hmm, anything mm -hmm. like that that you could say? I mean, you might have to go back and kind of reflect or review for a second, but is there anything like mm -hmm. that that sticks out in your mind and say, Boy, if I hadn't had all that experience, if I hadn't spoken about those things, that it probably would have been a lot different, or probably would have been a different situation. Yeah, it it happened in different phases. It's a great question, Mark. Um, I think it happened in different phases in the sense that at first something I think scary for me happened because I've been doing this for twenty years. I, I started Future Proof the late nineteen nineties as a side project while I, while I was still uh, taking parental leave uh, and still working at Baxter, um, and then it became a thing uh, a year later. Um, so several things. On the one hand, I I thought all of this would happen much faster. Uh, when I started, and, and, and you probably can uh, testify to this, when I started with this, I thought this business case is so clear to move to a sustainable future that that this will happen like we saw the digital revolution happen. You know, nobody forced people to use uh, iPads or switch to, uh, to iPhones or so. Uh, it just happened because it was compelling. And so for me, Looking back, I thought it would uh, it would take uh, you know much less time to get up to speed. But when I was in the hospital, something scary happened in the sense that they say with healthy people they have one thousand wishes. With sick people, you have one wish, and it's really to make it um, true uh, your condition. Uh, and all of a sudden, very quickly everything focused to just that uh, this being said when you are in a hospital and you see what's happening or not happening uh, and especially uh, how fast we see the changes signs of climate change that the things i've been speaking about for years that seem to be materializing like methane emissions and and you know possible tipping points uh, that you are um, triggering, et cetera. Very, very scary stuff. Um, and when I think about my kids who are um, 19, 22 and 24, and who are starting, you know, their student and professional life and have their whole life before them. We're really at a crossroad. And it's, it's uh, for me really, uh, on the one hand, scary to see those signs. But on the other hand, also really exciting to see that when they start their professional lives, they could really be the generation that starts to implement everything we know that needs to be done 
and that presents some clearer and more and more compelling business case. When we used to, when I used to, and you probably as well, uh, talk uh, 10, 10, uh, 15 years ago about climate change, it was this niche thing, you know, it was for philanthropists and hippies and all of that. Now you see the Black Rocks and the banks and pension funds of this world divesting from fossil fuel and, and you see every single sane major corporation has a, has a carbon or climate roadmap and, and knows that if they don't adapt, they will be the next Nokia or Kodak or Blackberry. But if they do take this seriously, and, and I, I mean not on a level of some hobby club that meets over lunchtime and, and thinks about uh, switching disposable cups for recycle ones, I mean at the CFO and CEO level, if they do take this climate opportunity seriously, um, like Patagonia or Tesla or other you know, leading companies do, there's a huge opportunity for them. And so that seeing, seeing those both sides of the coin on the one hand in the hospital scared me and depressed me because I was out of the game for so long. I was really like looking through the window at real life happening outside and, and things continuing to happen. That's a very strange feeling. But on the other side, you saw those, you know, those signs that it's starting to become mainstream and talked about on in boardrooms. And, and then, you know, I thought, well, maybe uh, this could be a tipping point in, in, in that sense as well, you know, and, 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 and all the work that we put in for so many years is now just leading that uh, the McKinsey's and others of this world to start to 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 look at this as something serious and and maybe it's going to try. I don't know if you're going to be on time and, and meet science based targets and all of that. Uh, there could be a lot of greenwashing and all of that, but it's it's a double it's a double you know take on this and and for sure just the proximity and 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 the idea of the my my kids future when i really reflect about it i can still be very uh, worried and sad about how we missed all these years but on the other hand i'm an optimist by nature and this is what i do uh, I, I i try to be uh, the cheerleader and and wave to the carrot and 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 you know uh, tell people that uh, there's opportunity on the other hand, and sorry if I speak too long, on the no, other hand, no, the carrot no, is not enough. Uh, and that's why uh, six years ago, I initiated uh, legal action against our governments um, to force them to up their game in terms of climate objectives. It's something similar to what's happening in the Netherlands where uh, this group of citizens won. Uh, so I believe that you know we'll need more than just a shiny carrot to, uh, to get there. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad uh, I'm a little pushy and made you go deeper because some some beautiful things came out. And, and I, I want to take us out of that the, this crazy year and kind of move us into the future a little bit more of where we're going and some things. But I do want to tickle on a few things uh, that you also said. So uh, you, you've spoken all over the world. You've spo spoken in Beijing and, and uh, other, other mm -hmm. places in Asia. Um, I, I as well. For years the, that I've been speaking there, the, uh, there'd be times where I'd go there and a lot of people were already wearing masks and there was no COVID. It wasn't also in the time of SARS mm -hmm. or, or, or uh, uh, any of that. It was surely because of the extreme air pollution and uh, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. there was some really heavy things in, in, in the going on in the air. There was a time when I was in, in China, where I didn't see the sun for three weeks, or was a time mm -hmm, where mm -hmm, I was in mm -hmm. India, I didn't see the sun for three weeks, and everybody mm -hmm. who was sane was wearing a mask. Um, this mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. I was in um, uh, Bangkok, Thailand, right before mm -hmm. um, the true lockdown and outbreak occurred, and uh, everybody was wearing masks there for probably only already three months because the air pollution mm -hmm. was so bad. And, wow. um, mm -hmm. and it, uh, we're very fortunate. We live in, in Europe and, and move around in a lot of developed countries that really have good air quality and not, not a lot of people are running around with masks. 
because of air pollution, but there is a, a very, and I don't want to get too much in the science, but there is a very tight correlation to air pollution, climate change, our biome sure. and, and the health of humanity and how that, mm -hmm. that ties as well as the spread of a pandemic or a biome. And so um, mm -hmm. that is definitely not a future I want. It's not a future I want to leave my children or my grandchildren. I'm sure you don't mm -hmm. either that mm -hmm. we're just getting used to it, to wearing face masks. And I mean, mm -hmm. what's, what's the next plan? What's the next level? If we're thinking on that thought that we're already forced to wear air, uh, uh, face masks um, because mm -hmm. of air pollution, well, the next pandemic or when air pollution gets even worse, now we go to a gas mask or an oxygen mask. And, and there's gotta mm -hmm. be a time where we stop and we, leave this planet better than we found it. We, mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. live within planetary boundaries and we kind of, uh, as business, as social entrepreneurs, as, as people that we don't just do the bare minimum. We say, okay, here's the standard the government or the regulators have, have given us and we're gonna meet that minimum. Why don't we set the bar a little bit higher and leave the planet and our, our production, our products, the way we do business, a little bit better than we found it because if the entire world today were to stop and reverse their direction on their impacts on the climate crisis on air pollution pollution greenhouse gas emissions the world would continue to warm there would still be pollution here it just doesn't disappear if we all stop somebody's mm -hmm. left with that cleanup and we need to mm -hmm. as businesses and this is what you mentioned earlier and i also mentioned in your in your biography is that, um, and, and Peter Diamanda says this as well, the world's mm -hmm, biggest mm -hmm. problems are the world's biggest business opportunities and the same mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with climate and biodiversity and all these things. They're the biggest opportunities for us to unite as global citizens and make mm -hmm, our world mm -hmm. better to clean up and to, to feel, fulfill that golden rule to do to do better on our planet. And I'm, you know, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not a preacher, I'm not some crazy tree hugger by no means. <laughs> I, I just know how the world works. And, and um, if you're doing good business, if you're leaving things and employees and planet and, and clients in a better situation than you found them, there's more job satisfaction, there's more profits, more returns, more opportunities that create jobs, uh, investments, and profits. And you mentioned CSR, and the new CSR is really environmental social governance. And as you mentioned, BlackRock and some of the other big organizations in our world that have divested and invested in sustainable index funds during the worst pandemic our world has ever seen, the worst, mm -hmm. worst financial downturns, the worst things that they're saying is, uh, you know, depression and and those things in the first, second, and third quarter of 2020, sustainable mm -hmm. index funds have outperformed conventional funds eight out of 10. The Morning Star Review, 25 wow. out of 28 on the Morning Star Review, sustainable mm -hmm. index funds outperform um, their conventional counterparts. Nikki, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, Goldman Sachs, S&B Global, uh, uh, S and B five hundred, all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know so uh, that, that the yeah. proofs and the pudding. And so when you mention those things, I think not only we're aligned, but I, I see that beautiful vision of where you're going, and that um, hopefully that gave you enough reserve during this time to weather through. I'm seeing that you look like you you know, you wouldn't look like someone who who's just fought a hard battle. You look like you've come back stronger and more convicted to to move forward in the right direction so i'm so glad I, that's the resilience i see that's the positive message of what i'm hearing from you and so i thank you for sharing that for me and we're going to go further into I, yeah go ahead please can i uh, build on your point because i i really like that point mark that you make that uh you know we're moving from this csr where the r is the responsibility thinking uh where you have to do it, it's compliance, you have to be in order, you want things less bad, uh, you know, wearing masks and this, this gloomy picture, 
to suddenly a shift in which it's, you know, it's something desirable. It's something that works and, and speaks the same language as, as businesses do. They see an, an opportunity, but not only businesses, also cities. And for me, that's been the DNA of what uh, we do at Future Proof, what I've been trying to do the last 20 years is, is telling people we don't only need to do that to save polar bears in 40 years or so, but if we do it right now, there's so much uh, return even on the short term. I, I sometimes compare it with the concept of, uh, you know, the financial metric net present value. Uh, it's the, the present value of future brand benefits. You're going to invest in something and, you know, the, the benefits will be in the future, but there's already value today in doing that. And, and the, the comparison you make with, with air pollution is a great one because I believe air pollution is a metric for the carbon intensity of your economy but it's an Im immediate uh, uh return you know there's whereas with climate change there's a lag of 30 to 40 years between emitting one ton of, of co2 and seeing the full effect of of climate change which is a scary thought in itself because it means that whatever we're seeing now is the effect of emissions up until the 1980s but on the other hand if we look at other what we call co-benefits it's much easier to sell climate action uh, to cities and to, to corporations. And, and one example that I found great when I was in the hospital, I saw what happened in Paris, uh, in which Anne Hidalgo, the mayor, has been very vocal about giving back the city to cyclists and pedestrians. Um, and she's been doing that for a year. And we were in, in touch. Uh, with the city hall a couple of years ago, we went there to present future proof cities, etc. And uh, and and in the hallways, people were saying, "Yeah, Anne Hidalgo, she's going for it, but it's political suicide, you know, taking the car, the the king car off the roads and giving this back to citizens. It's it's crazy. It's worthy, but crazy. And then what what happened in February of uh, this year? She went all in with her campaign of uh, developing what she calls 15 minute cities in which neighborhoods should be organized such that by foot or by biking, everything you need is within 15 minutes, uh, whether it's public transport or your job or groceries or the place where you work or whatever, uh, you know, and, and she wanted to push that idea, reorganize the big metropole that is Paris into neighborhoods, villages in which uh, green and pedestrians and cyclists have absolute priority. And she got massively reelected. That was for her reelection campaign and she had incredible support. So visionary leaders, whether they're in cities or corporations that not only say things have got to be less bad, but that realize that there's so much to gain from it on the short term and that have the guts to push that vision will be rewarded for it. And she was on a political level and it's the same thing I believe with, with uh, corporations. Um, again, Tesla I think is the most inspiring example uh, on, on, on the front of automobiles. Everybody laughed at them uh, when they started 15 years ago and it was, you know, it was a toy, a go-kart, et cetera, and bit by bit. And they never sold it just for for the climate, you know, even though that's their mission, accelerate the advent of sustainable energy, but they looked at the immediate benefits, make exciting cars that people will want. And, and all of a sudden they're a behemoth and, and all of the established pay players now only wake up and, and, and see that they're missing big time on, on this uh, opportunity. So what you mentioned, I think this, this shift from from a compliance thinking to a climate opportunity thinking is, is really a key leverage point to, to help us move ahead faster. I, I totally agree. My first question really to get into things uh, today is, are you a global citizen and how would you feel about the removal of all borders, walls, divisions, limitations of humanity dividing humans from one another? Hmm. That's a very good question. I never yeah. gave it deep thought like that, but it's a very good uh, question. 
because I'm I'm reading a book that's called How to Argue with a Racist. I'm, I'm just uh, yeah. <laughs> in the beginning. I don't know if you know of the book. Uh, uh, it's fascinating. And then you realize that that those maps where we have arbitrary lines <laughs> or those division based on pigmentation in your <laughs> pigmentation level in your our skin, etc., and and how we like to label and put people in categories and buckets, how, how artificial that is and how little signs, you know, or evidence there is for, for, for categorizing people like that. But I, I never gave the thought of-, of um, I can of let you think reading. about it for a second and tell you why I asked it, because I'm kind of leading in a direction. I want to see, uh, you know, if you've had some thoughts or if you've formulated over. So your, your business, Future Proof Cities, is working with cities all around the world, with cities uh, outside of Belgium, uh, across other nations and divides. Um, uh, during this time of the lockdown, we've uh, had a lot of, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, people of color uh, issues, mm -hmm. uh, issues mm -hmm. about uh, strong nationalism and things. But mm -hmm. the, there's been a few things that are really global citizens during this time. And let me, let me tell you, one is food, is cross borders mm -hmm. when humans haven't, uh, air, water, species, um, and obviously the COVID has not mm -hmm. held, held into boundaries or borders. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. those are all things that are global citizens, but where a lot of the problems are coming in is where we're, trying to capsule ourselves off into these nations and divisions. And really, you know, this may be the map behind me, but I just had uh, Parag uh, Kana on my, uh, uh, on my show uh, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And he does a lot about cartography and geospatial mm -hmm. data and talks about mm -hmm. maps. And, and he used geospatial data to look at maps and how our worlds bit up, uh, build up by supply change and, Mm -hmm. movements of goods and different things and and the picture that it, that turns up is much different than the one that somehow we're presented with on on a much different different level and when it comes to business and solving global grand challenges nations or cities cannot divide themselves from certain problems because those problems cross boundaries cross mm -hmm. nations and borders mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so um it, it's really to get to, to, to hear your thoughts or feelings of uh, future proof cities or even per, on a personal level mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. you're thinking and where you're going uh, where, where, where you're at with mm -hmm. this type of idea and how you apply that with your businesses and how we can get others to you know um, to think on the bigger picture and, and there mm -hmm. you you mentioned one good example just a minute ago where you mentioned uh, um, the mayor in, in, in France that uh, really is setting example but that example this doesn't hold to her mayorship it holds to the example she sets to others in the world because there are some leaderships in cities that are really uh where especially believe it or not in saudi arabia middle east they look to germany and france and, and europe quite a bit and say oh they have the best hospitals or they have the best quality production and and they kind of copy that and they look mm -hmm. to to others who are doing it good or better or have some success as an example. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I'm seeing that in climate and other things. And that's kind of why I asked you that question as well, because you studied in Illinois, you speak English and mm -hmm. French and probably Flemish and uh, other languages as well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I, I just, that's why I was kind of leading you trying to mm -hmm. ask that question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a great question, uh, and especially when uh, how it pertains to uh, to climate on on many levels. Uh, so I don't know where sh I should start. Maybe on the on the macro level, it's just the fact that on the on the crisis side, there is again a a big global asymmetry as to our historic rucksack, if you want, here uh, in the west or in the north about how we are massively responsible for you know climate change that we're seeing essentially now uh, whereas people living in the south uh, have almost uh, you know less than one one ton of co2 per person per year uh, cap per capita emissions so they're you know nowhere near 
uh, as responsible as we are for the, the massive accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that will go on for hundreds of years. So in a sense, we have a much bigger legacy, carbon legacy, and we are, have more responsibility, I think. Uh, but the effects do not see any boundaries, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and will likely be worse in those part of the world who are least responsible for adding to our bad type of, of carbon uh, emissions. So there's a very asymmetric and unjust um, balance uh, uh, there, uh, I think. On the other hand, on the solutions part, um, again, when you look at what our future looks like, uh, you know, from a very high level, we're essentially just moving from fossil to renewable energy. That's that's the basic of our way out here. And when you look at the solar income, um, this is a very new kind of resource that's not concentrated in Saudi Arabia or in the, you know the Gulf states. Uh, very dense, concentrated, uh, you know, source of all the energy that the world needs, leading to all the problems, your geopolitical problems and wars, etc. If we are serious about moving to renewable energy, now the solar income is spread much more equally across borders. And if we can tap into that opportunity and help those nations in the South build on that and capture that, it could completely flip, you know, also this, this uh, power imbalance, if you want, uh, of having a, a bit of concentration here and there. So that's, again, I think an opportunity. It's very tricky, as you said, Mark, uh, you also spoke uh, uh, elsewhere when, when doing your presentations on climate, etc. Uh, what I remarked when I was speaking in India, for instance, that even though there's uh, this opportunity there, it's a very tricky message to convey because it comes over as patronizing, you know? We have our cars and our air conditioning and our uh, Amazon.com and whatever, all the convenience and luxury. And now you go uh, and speak about the climate crisis. Uh, and it's as if you are, you know, waving your finger and, and telling uh, developing nations, uh, oh, don't develop too much and don't buy cars and this and that uh, because we have a climate crisis. Whereas, you know, we are essentially uh, responsible for that. Uh, if you flip it though, um, and you present it as an opportunity and you're uh, really concerned about the well-being and economic uh, situation of people um, in, in, in the South, for instance, and you can help them not make the mistakes that we made on an urban planning level, on an energy systems level, uh, then it's something completely different. Then it's being on, the, on their side instead of you know just waving your finger and it has happened before uh, for instance in africa uh, when you see what happened with telephony from no te telephony they didn't go through a landline system but they immediately skipped did a quantum leap to sell cell phones and for many years before we had apple pay and google pay you know they all were already doing financial transactions through their phones even though they were just um, you know uh, not smartphones but uh, normal functional phones um, so it's possible, and you see it in countries like Kenya and others, that they fully embrace this solar economy. And instead of rebuilding an old fossil energy network with all its inflexibility and, and infrastructure needed, they are starting to build distributed uh, energy internet that's, that's based on, on small uh, solar installations with small uh, batteries, etc., and provide villages with, with direct improvements in, in comfort. So there's that level, the big level. Uh, there's other, if we talk about boundaries, it doesn't even have to be, I think, cross country. Uh, I read a piece in the New York Times a month or so ago about how there's been a systemic bias to black communities in American cities and how at, uh, at the beginning of last century, some neighborhood, black neighborhoods and cities were really redlined as being dangerous to invest in because they were mainly neighborhoods with black uh, citizens. Uh, 
And so for years, this has propagated. And the result is now that in, in big cities in the US, uh, those neighborhoods that are hardest hit with uh, urban heat island uh, you know, effect, uh, with less trees, uh, wor the worst infrastructure, et cetera, are typically those people, uh, the neighborhoods with a large population of African-Americans. And, and, and it's, a, it's sort of a bias of boundary then within a country that has been artificially you know, kept alive and that now results in real consequences. People having a hard time just having comfortable houses or studying or getting to work, etc. Uh, and it's just heartbreaking to see that, you know, for, for people who already have a difficult time, you know, there's this added uh, legacy that's, that's thrown in there. But again, I think we can flip that and, and people like Eric Garcetti, the mayor of LA, for instance, who's a very a powerful advocate for climate action in city. He has a, he has a beautiful TED talk, by the way, of, of June of this year, really worthwhile watching about uh, how cities and mayors, uh, you know, represent a real opportunity for climate change. He said that, you know, this is uh, what they do in LA, for instance, is uh, try to prioritize uh, building resiliency in neighborhoods that have this historical disadvantage and start there uh, to start dealing and, you know, acknowledging that this bias has been there and that we really did a poor job addressing that. And, and so, again, if you see it as an opportunity, there's, you know, we can start to uh, mend that. And, but it's a very big question. And, and I yes, think yeah. it's a very important topic because the effects and the solutions will cross borders. So it's it's sometimes very um, depressing to see these nationalistic reflexes like we have in Belgium, in Flanders, uh, for instance, uh, where it's us against them. That's that's not the way uh, to, to go about this. If you see this from an opportunity mindset, there's plenty for everyone, especially if you go to renewable energy future, and it will only work if we all stick uh, stick together. And that's the idea behind Future Proof Cities, is, is that um, we see that uh, city teams, you know, more often than not, they're a small team. It's uh, one or two people working on climate, and they have to do permits and all kinds of things on the side. So they're overwhelmed. That's one. Two, it's really hard for them to focus and to know what can I do with my city team? Should I drive permits for renewable energy or, or and, you know, make sure that we use uh, recyclable cups at events or whatever, turn a public lighting to LED? Uh, you know, there's so many things to do. Where do you start? What's the biggest impact? What's the biggest urgency? What's the biggest financial return, uh, et cetera? But three, and that's the most uh, depressing, I think, is that most of their peers in other cities are facing exactly the same challenges. And so there's a lot of reinventing the wheel. Everybody is trying to do their best with the, the small teams and means that they have. Whereas, and that's what, one of the things we try to do with, with Future Proof Cities, if, if you can help them focus on, on those actions that matter, and give them the tools to sell climate action to their city council and tell the mayor, this matters, this will cost that much, this will create that much co-benefits, uh, local job creation, uh, property value that uh, increases biodiversity, clean air, as you mentioned, uh, reduced energy costs. So if you help your mayor decide and, and carry that, but not only that, if you help your peers in other cities, do as you do and, and share your failures and successes with them. We believe that there's, um, you know, that this is a real way to accelerate uh, climate action in cities who are responsible for 70% of the carbon emission. And that's, uh, th it's a great opportunity. And that's exactly what, what Eric Garcetti, the mayor of LA says, you know, cities around the world have so much in common it's complex to run a city there, you know, have all these layers of problems as infrastructure, but at the same time, it's a great scale to act on. You know, you can talk about big country level targets and European or global level targets, Paris Accords, et cetera. This is very abstract. 
you and I live in a city, you live in Hamburg, which is great, by the way, I think it's a, a great city. Uh, and you see that, you know, bikes have a priority bike lanes and that there's a program to insulate your house. This is where the, the, those big roadmaps actually translate into tangible action. And so the idea there of crossing boundaries and, and you know, avoiding reinventing the wheel everywhere is, is one of the things we try to work on. So I, I can tell you're not, uh, I'm throwing you off with my format a little bit because we have this deep dive dialogue. I'm definitely want to talk about future proof cities a lot more. Um, uh, that I'm trying to lead up and ease my listeners a little bit in with some of the questioning and that uh, mm -hmm. what you mentioned about uh, global citizenry and about removal of nations of borders and how we truly function is important for us and the listeners, uh, not only how you see it, but how, how Future Proof tackles it. And you, you, you touched upon some very important things there. And, and one important thing was that we, we speak in developing countries and countries that are really uh, still struggling and wanting to get the basic needs met. They, they haven't had them yet. And uh, the example you mentioned on telephony is perfect. What, what we want is by no means not them to develop and not to, them to have mm -hmm. super mm -hmm. infrastructures, but we don't want them to make the same mistakes that we've mm -hmm. all made mm -hmm. before and actually leapfrog some of those infrastructural mistakes that we've made mm -hmm. in the past and get them mm -hmm. up to one that's got a little bit more resiliency, uh, uh, definitely mm -hmm. more sustainability in it, mm -hmm. and one that is um, easier, profitable, it's a better model. And that's kind of mm -hmm. the things that we're talking about. And, and, and so I love that you, you touch upon that because it's absolutely vital. But that's where Future Proof Cities really comes in, right? Uh, mm -hmm, as far as mm -hmm. I understand, you're providing some tools and some services for cities um, that makes their life a lot more easier, but also is kind of a form of a global operating system as something that kind of can be unified with a few other cities and um, almost helps them leapfrog some of the older systems or some of the pains or uneases they've had in, in doing things in the past. Uh, yeah. If I if you could now kind of go into a little bit more of what that looks like and how how you came up with that and some of the success stories that you're seeing um, uh, with that kind of get us up to speed and and then then we'll go from there as kind of maybe talking a little bit more about the future. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, what we want to do is actually to fast forward. Uh, cities to climate action. Uh, when you look at climate action in, in cities, there's three parts really. It's starting by knowing your baseline, uh, uh, knowing where you are in terms of emissions, uh, CO2 emissions, and knowing if it's mainly from housing or transportation or industry or power generation. You don't just have a an assessment of where you are, and this is typically done through studies, etc. Uh, it involves uh, consultancies, uh, like like we used to do a lot in the past. We were a consultancy, and we worked, and we won tenders, and we worked for cities. The second is drawing up a plan. What should I do first? Uh, you know, uh, should we do a massive uh, energy renovations in neighborhood? Should we uh, build or rebuild? our city in a more resilient way with blue and green networks should we you know uh, cover all roofs with photovoltaic whatever you know and and not make mistakes in urban planning and and all of that uh, and then third is actually doing that executing that plan and we want to fast forward to that third part because uh, the first two are the most important to get started, but the third one, implementing, executing, have a transformation in your city is, is you know, the litmus test, really. That's what it's uh, all about. And so our platform, Future Proof Cities, uh, guides cities in their city journey, if you want, in, in this very step. And we try to meet cities where they are because the usual suspects like Hamburg, Heidelberg, uh, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Paris, uh, you know, they're way ahead 
of most other. They have a vision, they have a big team, they know exactly what they want, they know the tools to get there. For instance, Stockholm, there's a great TED talk about that, how they introduced congestion charge, you know, for limiting the, the uh, movements with, with cars and, and entice people to take public transport or use their bikes. Uh, and they first did a poll and asked the citizens, what do you think? Uh, and see, I think like 65% of the people were opposed to congestion tax because they say life is already expensive and blah, 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 all the valid and usual reasons. But then they imposed it during six months. They did it uh, as a test. And then they did a poll again after those six months. What they saw is that the very first day of this test for six months, there was 20% less traffic. And 20% less traffic, it means that essentially the traffic jams dissolve and people say, oh, wow, and they discover their way to bike lanes or to public transport. After that, on uh, August 31st, I think in, I don't know, maybe 2007, a, a while ago, um, they, um, they canceled the, the pilot and it was like before, people could drive whenever they want for free. And they saw that on the September the 1st, it was just as before, people jammed up, you know, long queues, etc. And then they did the poll again. And they saw that slowly the support for congestion tax completely flipped. And that people saw that sometimes an adult needs to take a decision and say, this is how we do things. Like, you know, not smoking in restaurants or, or wearing seat belts of a, not using asbestos when you build, uh, you know, uh, new houses. And sometimes somebody needs to take that decision. So you have those cities that are way ahead of, of the others that have financing and rule setting, etc. all figured out. You have others, as you mentioned, that are just starting this journey. And with Future Proof Cities, we want to meet them where they are. And, and if your need is just to establish uh, your baseline and, and drop a climate plan uh, about what you can do, this is what we will help you with. You, you with. If you're already you know, fully in the organizing phase and organizing and executing this, and you want to learn from your peers, we'll help you with that. So it's a, it's a platform that's um, easy to use, compelling, attractive, not too technical, that will help cities throughout their journey uh, um, on this this uh, climate journey, if you want, from from the very beginning to the execution, but is built with the idea that, as I'm just mentioned, that many peers like you will be facing uh, the same kind of uh, uh, issues. So, in the tool, the tool is useful even if only one city would use it. But we built a community in there. It's a bit like LinkedIn or so, where you can share with your colleagues, your peers, and saying, look, we did this. We, uh, we built a district heating system in, in Brugge, and this is how we got European subsidy for it. Or we're developing a new uh, real estate project, and we want to get rid of the parking places, but instead offer car sharing. And this is the tender document that we use to do this. This is the kind of exchange that we see uh, on the platform. And then we bring our user base together. We used to do it physically. Uh, uh, before COVID, uh, because it's mainly users from Belgium now, but we're starting in Spain, Sweden, uh, and France also. Uh, and we, we bring these users together because they have a real, you know, need for being connected and, and talking to their peers and seeing what works and what does. The first part, we're also just to, to close on, on that, the first part, we just uh, made it public and open source. So we have now, uh, you know, the, the database engine of Future Proof Cities that we open source, we call it Launchpad. Uh, and it covers uh, all 95,000 uh, municipalities in Europe. So any city in Europe can go on uh, launchpad.futureproof.com and see their carbon emissions, see how it's been evolving in the last couple of years, see if it's transportation or mobility. And so we wanna you know, skip that part and move to the real important stuff, which is how do we get this financed? What are the co-benefits? Who's doing what? How can we collaborate with the team 
uh, whether it's a city team or a team it with your peers and and you know focusing on on this action and this is what we uh, we try to do it's a yeah. modest yeah. thing though amar because we cannot claim that a tool or a platform like that will change the world or or you know solve the complexity of climate action and climate action in city it's it's a small thing we can do but it's like like you would have strava you know for, for work out app or, or or dropbox or you know or spotify better tools to get your goals uh, done better tools for better progress i have a few questions or a few comments as well so I do a lot of uh, ESG advising and help companies. And basically it's for the end of the year annual report uh, that they do after the year. And mm -hmm. uh, the way that has typically worked, and I wanna see, uh, this is what I hear out of you and, and also what I kind of wanna make a comment about is that they, they the end of the year comes and I say, okay, we gotta put out our annual report. What did we do this year that could be where we can fit these SDGs or this sustainability matrix or this CSR into our annual report so that we can report upon it. What I hear from future proofed cities and, and that is it's more action based. So it's like, mm -hmm. what actions can we take and, and projects can we place and, and start now to manage and record and to have that data and then create projects and actions that will lead us to more monies, more funding, more actions that at the end of the year, we actually have some actionable fun things to report on at the end of the year and say, and they're all success stories. They're all, you know, some could fail or some could go wrong, mm -hmm. or you could have a learning cur curve, but the majority of them are all kind of an action-based transition, a journey to the end of the year. And then you say, oh, wow. And look, we achieved this and we lowered this and we were able to, to get this funding and we had the data on this. Uh, and that's what I hear out of what, what you're saying. And, uh, and that is the key. And that's also what I advise all my, all, all those companies that I deal with on as well is instead of waiting until the end of the year and see how you can fit your annual report into the SDGs or the Paris Agreement or CSR, why not set actions and projects and things at the beginning of the year and then have these wonderful, fun, uh, actionable things throughout the year that at the end or at the end of each quarter, at the end of each month, you say, oh my God, we reached this many people or we had this draw, draw down our emissions this much or we had this positive impact and excite and, and rally your customers, your clients, your corporation, your organization around that. And then at the end of the year, when you report, it's not a greenwashing, it's such a positive story and narrative that they say, holy shit, wow, this is fabulous, this is terrific, and uh, it's great. And that's kind of what I hear out of what you're saying. But I, ha I had a couple of questions, and uh, I'm almost wondering if you could go a little deeper in it to me, because you you talked about uh, these congestion maps and, and congestion tax and things. Are you using geospatial data? Are you using systems dynamic modeling, any, any of this, or is this, uh, a little bit more analog to get that information and that's more, maybe more the future what kind of tools are you providing them where they can say wow that you know this is something uh, uh fabulous uh mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more on that it's a very good point um uh, mark so uh, as you summarize well this is what we try to do so we help focus on implementation we make sure teams have everything integrated in one place instead of having Excel and MS project and this and that, uh, you know, all over the place. And we help them collaborate. And it's this exact shift that you mentioned from a reporting mindset to an action mindset. That's what we uh, try to uh, to do with Future Proof Cities. Uh, I'll get to the, the geospatial data question in a second. One of the key elements that I didn't mention is that we focus on those co-benefits as well of climate action. As I mentioned in the earlier discussions, we believe there are short-term benefits for climate change and it's the same thing for, for cities. So instead of having this reporting hat, as you mentioned, oh, it's the end of the year, what can we tell? You know, what makes a good press release? It's again, what are the intrinsic co-benefits of driving climate action in a city? 
and there are many, and we visualize those in the tool. As I mentioned, can be uh, you know job creation or greener air, but there's also a very strong financial case to be made. And so one of the things we built in there is what is called an abatement cost curve in which you, you've, you've seen the, these maybe, in which you can see how much which will each action actually cost or yield, because many of the things are actually profitable. And how can I bundle those into a you know, package of measures that will have a big impact CO2-wise, but will still have some profitability. And if you do that, you think in terms of you know, product project development. You think that, like we've been doing city transformation for decades. When you look at a new, uh, I don't know, a new sewer system or a new square or uh, public lighting or whatever, you know, we, we see city transformation happen all the time and it's being planned, organized, financed. And for some reason, when it comes to climate action, we're stuck. It's like, yeah, we're, it's too costly and we don't have any money for that. And, you know, if you see it as the same way as, as doing infrastructural change and improving a city, it's no different than that. So we offer those tools to, to, uh, to help with the city transformation in a collaborative way. To your second point is, um, it's a very good point because we are, this is the future we want to go to, but for the moment, on both points, it's more analog than that. Um, in fact, the very first iteration of future-proofed cities was all about better, higher resolution data. Uh, like you said, geospatial data, we looked at cell phone data, real-time uh, uh, data from uh, utilities about gas, water, electricity use. We had uh, access to all of that. And we use a process called the design sprint in which before you build something, whether it's software or something else, you actually prototype it and you test it with your, your users. It's a five day process. You, you, know, you create uh, your ideas, you sketch them, and then you build a prototype. And then you ask your real users, hey, we're building this, uh, how do you like it? And, and you, you look at how they, uh, they use the product. And we did that with Proof Cities all about this better data. And we had real time uh, feedback loops about uh, you know, traffic and energy and all of that. And, and city said, great, yeah, that, that'd be great, but it's not helping us solve our current problems, which is you know, get this climate actions, the opportunity of climate action up to the priority of the mayors and the city council so that they take it seriously and that we can you know, get going as we do with, with other city transfers. So that was their main question. And so we kind of put that on the back burner a bit, but now as, as we grow bigger, we have an, uh, what is called an API, an application programming interface. So we are able to connect and export uh, to other platforms. And you see the rise of digital meters, you see uh, initiatives like, for instance, Google Environmental, Insights Explorer, which is a platform in which they have 3000 cities mapped and they look at the traffic flows. They look at the opportunity for uh, solar PV by having detection of the type of house, etc. So there's all kind of new sources of data available. And our vision is to were useful again for the city teams because there's a danger that we would fall in love with our product and that we you know we build a solution in search of a problem that's a real uh, real risk so we always are informed by the questions and the challenges that our city teams experience and they say hey we need to do this or this doesn't work well or we don't understand this or this has never been used this is what drives our development team but we see that in the future we'll be able to connect to better sources so we're we're really open for that and, and certainly looking at it. The second point is, even more, or the third point is even more pertinent. Do we look at this from a systems thinking perspective? And that's, that's really interesting that you mentioned that because the genesis of Future Proof, the company actually is, is very driven by systems thinking. The, the book that made me switch uh, careers, if you can say, I was in the medical business before, uh, is called Natural Capitalism uh, by Amory Lovins. So you, you may have heard of it. And, yeah. and it's all about systems thinking uh, about how if we look at the big picture and take 
everything into account. We can actually, you know, drive improvement in a much better way. And this applies to cars or data centers or heating of houses or, you know, building factories. Um, instead of just improving one little bit, you know, uh, improving, for instance, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the rolling resistance just of your tires or improving 3% uh, efficiency of your engine. If you start by making your car lighter, uh, you will need a smaller engine and you will need uh, smaller hydraulic systems, which in turn will reduce the rolling resistance and all of that, you know. And so it, it applies for, for many, many things. Uh, looking at it in a systemic way is always the way to go. Again, it's not like that yet in future-proof cities. We're, we're at a more basic, if you want, a list of 100 plus pre-calculated measures. It's like a, a Spotify catalog, if you want, uh, of, of uh, solutions for mitigation and mm -hmm. adaptation with nature-based solutions that we adapt to a regional context. So this catalog will be using different data in Sweden than it will in Spain, for instance, but they're not interlinked yet. They're not seen yet from a systemic way, but we are going there, uh, you know. That's not, we're it takes still too time. Small. Yeah, it takes that? time. It takes yeah, time. Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah. but I, I just, I appreciate you answering that. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, no, there, there's always that journey and it takes time to develop, especially the good things. And, and uh, I'm, I look mm -hmm. forward to really <clears throat> seeing that develop and see more. But it sounds like a fabulous, um, a fabulous uh, idea company doing good things and exactly different than as i mentioned before than mm -hmm. what we're used to seeing which is really where we need to go a little more actionable a little bit more mm -hmm. uh positive help for cities mm -hmm. which they really need the cities have the unique ability to be a lot more flexible than than big nations or countries mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. in, in the respect that um there's not as much separation of ministries uh, on what they can do so they can work mm -hmm. more in systems in a lot of mm -hmm. respects so that's there's there's quite some benefits and so mm -hmm. i'm really glad to see it because that's where we live we live in cities not in exactly you yeah. know yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and so it's nice to kind of go bottom up for the resources and, and make that mm -hmm. shift and change so mm -hmm. thank you for telling telling uh, me about that and i have a, a few more questions before we wrap up because we've already been talking mm -hmm. quite a bit i haven't even hit on the most important hardest question i have for you today it might make you uh think for a moment but it's the burning question wtf and that's what we've all been probably asking ourselves this year and it's not the swear word uh although we've been asking ourselves that it's what's the future mm -hmm. sir what mm -hmm. is the future huh. wow that's a million dollar question um Again, it's it's hard to answer that honestly. Uh, it's really hard, I think. I was asked this in a, in a podcast uh, a month or so ago, and I was taken a bit uh, off guard by this question um, because it was put slightly different. Uh, the guy asked me, you know, my kid is now 10 years or so, or six years, uh, you know, uh, what will happen when they're in their 20s, uh, 30s, um, like the interviewer was? And, you know, what will they li their life look like in 2040 or 2050? Um, and it took me a bit of guard because a point that I mentioned earlier, uh, even if we were to be successful and really moving off of fossil fuels quickly in time following the science-based targets we have this delay as i mentioned of 30 or 40 years um, and we know that whatever we do how successful we are things are probably going to get much worse before they get better again and and that's sometimes i think a very hard thing 
to realize because on the one hand we have this terrible division. I don't know if you saw the, the, the Netflix documentary, uh, The Social Dilemma, uh, about, yeah. yeah. One of my the good big friends, idea that the Kirsten internet... Harris was in that and he'll actually be on the podcast in a couple of weeks, so. Oh, really? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know, this big idea of the internet would all bring us together like it does sometimes, like this is great. Uh, but I actually turned out into division and polarization and, and much worse things. Um, so we have those things, we have all kind of other real issues, COVID, et cetera. And on top of that, we know that there's this latency of the climate system. So sometimes I think it's really hard to maintain that optimism. On the other hand, what I mentioned earlier, I truly believe, otherwise I would have given up a long time ago and just spent time writing books and going kite surfing. Uh, on the other hand, I really believe that we are now seeing the advent of the tipping point with the divestment campaigns, with uh, the automobile and fossil major uh, under pressure, with the leadership that cities uh, are showing and and the response that people give when you know when you create 15 minute cities or you prioritize bike lanes or you create plant based tasteful food or, or all of that people are embracing that because it's better uh, and then not just the niche of early adopters but it's it's reaching a wide uh, you know a wider audience of the, uh, reaching the mainstream so that makes me very hopeful and and so I'm, I'm torn about the future and I, I want to believe that we will be successful and be in time to tip also you know the balance in favor or of a more attractive fossil free uh, uh, economy and, and society uh, but I don't want to be naive um, and you know it better than anyone probably we're not there yet there's a lot of hard work to do but I'm hopeful. I remember when I did uh, the Al Gore training, um, the first night we went to House of Blues with the, with the people and Al Gore was there and, and we, we talked. And he said that at the time he had already been doing this for you know, years or decades. Years, yeah. yeah, 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 probably. Uh, and he said it felt very solitary for this time. And I know that we joined, you know, the cavalry was there. He probably said the same thing to you. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very striking image. And I feel that now the cavalry is arriving on many levels. Uh, uh, but the question is still out there, will we be in time? And, and will we be distracted by division and nationalism and other things? Because if we don't solve the climate problem and if we don't transform it into a climate opportunity you know we can forget about all the other problems really the, the risk of this tipping point is so big that you know uh, um, but overall after especially after this this crazy year i'm i'm still hopeful and i'm still working towards that goal that that's all i can do try to have fun with it try to uh, you know point to the to the benefits of doing this and and rally as many actors as possible in cities and in and, and companies but also just amongst uh, citizens uh because the more we convey this message that it's uh, it's feasible it's necessary but it's most of all attractive to go there to move off of fossil fuels and and build a sustainable world the more chance we have of, of actually realizing it thanks for your optimism and for your honesty as well and the, i can tell that you've been doing this for a while and it can take the the wind from your sails that you know like uh you know we've got a lot to do and, and <clears throat> you're kind it could be teetering so i like to hear your optimism and that you're that you uh, you don't want to be naive in any any uh, forms of the mean. 
I, I truly believe in How humanity. How about you, though, Mark? Yeah. I, I truly believe in humanity. I believe that uh, I understand the exponential function and how quickly things this year has shown not only all sorts of things bubbling to the surface, but has shown a microscope on all the problems in our system. And by showing us where the problems are in, in our civilization framework and our climate efforts and our biodiversity efforts and our energy efforts, et cetera, we've also under the microscope been able to see where we need to do, what we mm -hmm. need to do to fix mm -hmm. those. And the, the biggest thing is uh, the, the basic needs of humanity and really rally, uh, rallying humanity together as global citizens, mm -hmm. unifying ourselves that we set a new global operating system and, and mm -hmm. a level of unification worldwide uh, for humanity, but that in a pandemic, we can do uh, amazing things. In the time mm -hmm, of crisis, mm -hmm. we can do mm -hmm. amazing things. And I have extreme hope and optimism that we'll, we're on the right path. We will do mm -hmm. it. We're, we've seen uh, the take up of uh, new leadership and shifts at the beginning of this year. This is the beginning of this year started out with a bang. It was a decade of action, lots of movements, a lot of companies mm -hmm. reconfirming, mm -hmm. making some action, some positive steps. And now so even more, not just the financial returns that we're seeing through ESG investments, first, second, and third quarter, and, and what should be a horrible year for everybody mm -hmm. shows mm -hmm. that by having a better model, by having a, a better system, operating system to do those in, which is environmental social governance, put connect ourselves with the planet, but put planet uh, 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 first that we don't harm our resources and our mm -hmm. energy sources mm -hmm. for the future mm -hmm. is re really a better model. And once we really uh, understand that, that critical mass will put us on this exponential roadmap to solve a lot of mm -hmm. problems and do it in, in record time. The, the thing that you mentioned uh, that, was, that was interesting is that, um, and I mentioned this in the very beginning, if we all stop today to pollute, to hurt our environment, mm -hmm. and we all were doing the right thing, every business, every individual, it wouldn't be enough because our planet continues to warm, it continues mm -hmm. to heat and have climate mm -hmm. crisis. As mm -hmm. you said, it could take you know anywhere 20 to 30 years to see. Mm -hmm. But if every business in the world didn't just do the bare minimum and stop, but cleaned up the planet and did more mm -hmm. in a positive mm -hmm. direction to mm -hmm. rebalance mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. using the exponential function. What mm -hmm. would happen is we would not only go in the right direction, our whole world would be different where mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we would get back into the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. And right now mm -hmm. we're out of balance of five boundaries of our nine uh, planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we use the exponential function and the tools mm -hmm. through planetary services to clean up like uh, Voilent Slate is doing with the Ocean Cleanup mm -hmm. Project, mm -hmm. like Elon Musk is doing with his overarching mm -hmm. mission with mm -hmm. all his things and, and many, many other greats are doing out there to clean up. If we mm -hmm. had 100,000 or reached a critical mask of individuals like that, that made a shift in the consciousness, that critical mass is enough to get us on that exponential curve and create a rebalancing that would, would solve a lot of problems. And, and, and it's not all, we're still gonna see problems and disasters in the future, but what it does is creates a solid infrastructure for us by December, 2030 for the Sustainable Development Goals or the Paris Agreement. And I just wanna to touch mm -hmm. on that for one second. Mm -hmm. Throughout all that you mentioned, and the question was, what's the future? Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I mentioned that and why that's so important, what's the future, is if you don't know, doesn't matter, it's you, me, or anybody else, if you don't know what the future is, guess what? You're never going to get there. Because without mm -hmm. a plan, a roadmap, or a vision of what the future mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. if you don't have a government, nation, or city that has a clear roadmap or plan of what that future is, 
you're never going to reach it. What's going to happen is you'll be in the future and then you're going to look back and say, how can we fit, fit the <laughs> yeah, yeah. past into our <laughs> annual report or our business model, right? Uh, yeah. You're going to do exactly what we talked about. But you and I come from a generation of Star Trek and these movies that showed mm -hmm. these different visions of the future. So if today on TV, instead of seeing dystopian visions, we mm -hmm. had media or mm -hmm. got these visions of what a future would look like, I guarantee mm -hmm. you we could engineer, architect, create, design, and reach those futures with that plan, that vision, and that mission. Um, it's like mm -hmm. Simon Sinek's why, you know, it's kind of like, what is mm -hmm. the future? And if you have that vision, even if it's wrong, a, a wrong vision is better than no vision, because mm -hmm. with no vision, you're never going to reach that no vision. You, mm -hmm. We need to unify ourselves as humanity and have uh, one or two unifying visions uh, of a certain end date uh, of where we want to go in the future and then rally ourselves around that. And my last rant, uh, as far as getting on my soapbox, is that's really the, the, the Paris Agreement. If you realize mm -hmm. it's the world's first ever global moonshot. If you mm -hmm. think about it, 197 countries for the first time ever came together and agreed on the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, first time ever. If you know anything about diplomacy or politicians, it's hard enough for two countries to decide where mm -hmm. they're gonna go mm -hmm. to loan, mm -hmm. let mm -hmm. alone 197. And so not only is that the first global historical uh, mm -hmm. moonshot, first ever, but it's a historical precedence. It's never mm -hmm. occurred before mm -hmm. on a global level. The time before that was John F. Kennedy saying, we want to go to the moon. That was one nation and a couple thousand peoples and some, some partners in other countries. But this is a historical precedence. And if we chose that as our vision and our message and our, our vision of what's the future, and we started to work towards that, I think we would have a better chance than just saying, oh, I think it's the new green deal. Oh, I think it's the Trumpocalypse vision or Biden's vision, or I think mm. it's the Bolsonaro vision. I think it's the Brexit vision. If we unified ourselves with a new global operating system, a new vision that was sustainable and resilient, and also had media and visions of what that looked mm -hmm. like, we'd have a lot more things to work for. And that goes back to what you're doing. It's action-based goal or mission or target that mm -hmm. we're going to. And if you have that, you can be optimistic and hopeful and see the future. If you don't have something like that, then it's really easy to get muddled up. Well, uh, I don't trust Bolsonaro. I don't trust Trump. I don't trust the Brexit. I don't trust the Putin, Shays, Dewart, Shays, Erdogan's. And they're not looking out for my best interest. And that's why we have so much unrest, unease, because humanity is kind of uncertain about our current civilization frameworks it's failing us it's not giving us the vision we need to say don't worry we can relax we've got a beautiful vision we're working toward nobody knows what we're working towards we're going to go from mass to gas mass to oxygen mass to, to this dystopian futures and we need mm -hmm. some different types of futures and so i'm sorry to get off on a rant but i, no, I, I really want I, I want you to know that i i see it's the optimism point. of yeah. what you say yeah. and i want to not don't get discouraged because you've been doing this so long or think oh i'm tearing out my hair because this is this is kind of frustrating. You see, there's not much left <laughs> Mark, i think it's a great great point uh it's a great and important point um I've been criticized about being too much about this vision and what could be. And then my business associate, for instance, is a very grounded guy and, you know, he's about how things are and, and we need to step into the shoes of businesses or city teams, et cetera, and understand that reality. And both are valid, of course, because if you stay up there, you know, financiers or others who will say, yeah, okay, well, keep dreaming. But if you don't have that vision, as you said, it's a very valid point. And you do back casting and eh, starting from where we want to end. And then you calculate what are the steps needed to get there instead of just having marginal improvements here and there. Uh, it's a great point. And as you say, it's kind of happening. The Paris Accord, it's, uh, you know, five years ago. 
But what we see with the European Green Deal, for instance, is like a translation of that Paris Accord for Europe. And it's for the first time that it's so front and center for European Commission, while at the same time we're disagreeing with nations and we have the Orbans and others, you know, Hungary and you know, terrible things happening and nationalism flaring up. It, it can be a real unifying vision for Europe and for the world to say this is what we're going to do. We're going to translate that Paris Accord into a compelling vision, creating jobs, you know, become uh, energy and independent. And, and as you say, one of the most exciting things to remember when you have this vision is the power of exponential improvement, the learning rates of solar or wind or EVs. And, and when you see how that's progressing and how could that could lead us to this future, it's true, it's, there's a lot to be hopeful for. And, and very specifically, like in, in, in Europe, when you look at how we lead in terms of offshore uh, wind, uh, Germany is the second, UK is the first country in the world, China then, and Belgium, we only have 67 kilometers of coast, but we are the fourth in total amount of produced terawatt hours of, uh, we have two ter terawatt hours of uh, offshore uh, electricity being produced and it's gonna double in the next coming years to four. So it's a gigantic for a small country and Again, if we package that not only in marginal improvements or tech things or you know what's happening here and there, but if we package that into this unifying vision of the Paris Accord and we translate that into tangible benefits for people, there's a lot to be uh, hopeful uh, for. So thank you for pointing that yes, out. I, I fully you. agree with it. Uh, I used to have a fun slide. I, I don't know if I still have it uh in my presentations which was a passport and on this passport a european passport and instead of having the the stars of all the european nations it was actually the backbone of the super grid that we need to build to become fully you know uh, uh fossil free and and relying on on renewable energy and the beautiful thing there is that this is a real hard problem to solve if only belgium or you know, the, the Netherlands look at it, but it becomes much more feasible if all of us start to build because there's always it's gonna be wind somewhere. We're gonna be able to pump hydro in the Alps to store it and, and you know, have uh, more solar on other places, et cetera. And, and, and you know, to make the problem more feasible, you know, enlarge it and, and, and attack it with all of Europe or all over the world. And, and I, th I thought it was such a, a hopeful uh, image to build towards. So thank you for uh, reminding me of that. And I think it's a great uh, takeaway. You're, you're most welcome. Al Gore always says the only um, uh, uh, thing, uh, pol political will is a renewable resource in and of itself and that he's a recovering politician. And um, <laughs> uh, there's another saying that you're, you're only crazy or utopian or audacious or naive until you actually do it. And uh, I think that, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, here's to the crazy ones that actually do it and then it's not crazy anymore. Um, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just a better business model. It's a better operating system for our world. I only have three questions left for you and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and they're yeah, yeah. really self selfish um, questions for my listeners, because it's something to give them a, a, a little empowerment and a little bit something to take away from surge and, and uh, future proof cities. And that is, is if there was one message you could depart to my listeners, a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? For me, the biggest change that people can make, whether it's on a personal level, in a company, in an organization, in a city, is to shift classes, to change from, as I mentioned earlier, this compliance, we have to do this, we have to be less bad at it, and put on the glasses of opportunity. What can this bring us? How can it enrich my life? to start biking more instead of always taking my car, to start eating plant-based, et cetera, to, uh, 
uh, and you can do that on all levels. Um, and, you know, uh, switching the way we look at the world is on a systems thinking level. Eh? When you look at what Donella Meadows proposes, uh, we can turn the dials and knobs and improve a bit here and there. Uh, but just like to your prior point, if you look at the world differently and you see this as an opportunity, it becomes very different. It becomes something you want to do instead of something you have to do. And uh, and then there's a lot for you for, for the taking and, and, and to get going. So I think that's probably the most important thing people can do now and more and more are doing so. That's beautiful. What have you experienced or learned in your pro professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Yeah, the biggest thing there is don't just have a great idea, but think about your customer. There's always a customer, even if you're in a nonprofit or you want to solve malaria or, you know, you want not just to be thinking about you, oh, I have this great idea for a product or a service or a business or whatever and go out and do it. No, whose problem are you solving? If you're starting an artisanal bakery, you know, what do people need and want and step into their shoes and try to really understand their needs and then build something for them that you can reliably provide and, you know, make sure that you can pay your bills and, and the salary of your, your team with. But, really always start from your customer and truly listen empathetically and test your ideas, etc., and then build whatever you're offering to them. That's probably one of the most important things uh, Perfect. In, in, in business. So I see Future Proof as a sustainable innovation company and Future Proof mm -hmm. cities as a uh, form of a planetary service that you offer to mm -hmm. cities, mm -hmm. city service, uh, which mm -hmm. as really goes in the direction of sustainability, environmental mm -hmm. social governance, and, and real, the bigger picture biodiversity and kind of the, mm -hmm. the big climate issues, the big energy issues of, of our mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. um, what actions could startups, innovators, citizens, or decision makers take that would help to accelerate the impact that your field could make in, in your company and future proof cities? What could they do to help you to accelerate your impact? Well, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for asking it on, on your podcast. Um, it's a bit opportunistic. Uh, and you know just to ask for for things but the the help that we can have is uh, to build out the the network effect you know if you go to a platform like strava for which is a i don't know if any everybody knows it but it's an app to to track your running and biking activities uh, etc this app works great if just you want to go run or bike and you can track your performance and have inspiration of what tracks to run, etc. But it works even greater when there's a group of people cheering you on and telling you, hey, Mark, uh, you should really check out uh, this great trail in the woods or, uh, you know, I, I, I set out a bike uh, journey of five days. Uh, in the north of Germany that you will like, blah, 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 etc. Uh, then it becomes even greater. And I think we are still really uh, really at a micro scale with Future Proof Cities. We have a 140 cities, even though it already represents something. When we look at their investment, it represents 4 billion euro in, in investment in climate action. Uh, Collectively, those cities save 350 million euro a year uh, with their energy savings and 1 million ton of CO2. It's not much, but it's a start. Um, if this were to increase and our goal is to go to a thousand cities in a couple of years, the value 
of this for each of the cities becomes much larger. Uh, you know, it's 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 uh, you'll have a team of experts uh, at your fingertips if you want in the community, and not only again the pioneers, but cities or municipalities just like you. And and I think if there's any way to to you know help us increase that what they call network effect and and then our cities will be served better and we have a better chance of accelerating climate action and, and uh, be on track. So that's that's our vision. Um, it's easier said than done, but slowly but surely we're moving in that direction. So if anybody can help, uh, you know, spread the word about us uh, and have people try out our demo or reach out to us, so that, uh, that'd be great. I'm sure my listeners will, and they'll go, uh, I'll put your uh, links in the show notes so they can go there. Is there any other place besides Future Proofed uh, website that you want them to go to or check something out, or is that good enough? Um, let them uh, have a look at the Launchpad, which is our you know, open source uh, initiative. It's always an interesting starting point, uh, and there's, there, there's the information as well, but it's, it's going to be linked on the Future Proofed website. Another thing I do, which is my other hat, we didn't talk about it, is uh, the climate case uh, I run um, in Belgium. It's a stick, it's a different approach, but it's also a real leverage point that people have, uh, you know, if they want to demand this change. And it worked in the Netherlands. It's called, uh, in, in our case, it's called klimaatzaak.eu. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the link. Uh, and it's the idea that we, are facing these decades of transformation and that we cannot just do it through individual change or through businesses or cities, but that we will need the help of our governments. Like we have done that in the past to build out energy systems and the, the highways, etc. All of that, you know, we have the guide, we need the guidance of our governments. And so in the Netherlands, they won this legal case uh, forcing all political parties to align and stop making this a political issue and, and instead think, how are we going to get this done and finance? Uh, in Belgium, we have the same thing and in Ireland, day one. So it's another uh, tool in the toolkit that we will need. I would like nothing more just to have the carrot, but uh, we'll need all of it to, uh, to um, get there, I think. That's beautiful. Um, please uh, know I will put those in the show description so that they can look at those links. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have for you today. It's been a sheer pleasure. We could speak for hours, I guarantee, because we <laughs> yeah. were only tickling the surface, but uh, there are mm -hmm. so many interesting things that we could discuss and go into deeper. We're going to have to do that maybe next year for another podcast. And I wish you a wonderful holiday season, a new year, and, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Thank you, Serge, so much. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Mark. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you so much for having me.